King 1-2, 1-2. Right, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and uh, since we've been at lunch, we've received a, uh, a letter or a statement from uh, a local parish councillor, Councillor Josh Dooney, which I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Councillor Huffer to read out. But since this is, we are going to, uh, I'm going to, we're going to time this statement and we're going to go across to, um, I think we're going to go across to Mr. Kelly and allow him to make any comments if he wants to take up the same amount of time. So. Thank, yeah. thank you, Chairman. Just to correct you, the district councillor re representing the same ward that I do, which is Fordham Villages and Allington. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman and committee members for allowing me to do so today. I and my fellow councillor urge this committee to respond to, this, to the consultation on this application with a clear and resounding objection. 
I am conscious that you will have heard, uh, have heard and will hear many of the compelling reasons why this application is wrong, and if approved, will have a devastating impact on the communities and the landscape that are affected by that, by this. For this reason, I have decided to work with Council Huff to ensure we have covered different points and avoid duplication, but I wish to clear, I wish to be clear that I fully support Councillor Huff's statement. The first point I wish to make is that my objection to this application is no way an objection to solar energy or lack of recognition of the challenges we face in order to achieve net zero. I'm proud that East Cams generates more renewable, renewable energy than any other district in, the, in Cambridgeshire. My objection is to the monolithic scale of this application, which will change the place that we know and love forever. Planning policies are carefully adopted by this council to protect our residents from inappropriate development. This application feel, fails to adhere to so many of these, it feels like this application is designed to assault every part of our community-led planning approach. We've heard that the height and massing of the proposals would be contrary to the policies ENV1 and ENV2 with regards to the unacceptable in visual intrusion into open countryside. But I also wish to point out the potential impact covering 1,600 acres of agricultural land in glass and concrete. In recent years, we've seen significant changes in weather and localized flooding has been suffered by large areas of our community. ENV8 of our local plan looks to protect our community against flooding. This application would result in inevitable increased flood risk where rain would normally be managed by natural soak away uh, and well-managed farmland instead of the runoff from panels and hard standings would likely to create torrents of water which would destroy homes and businesses. ENV9 addresses how increased pollution should be avoided and managed. And although it would be naive not to recognize that pollution would be reduced on a national or international scale by the introduction of this renewable scheme, although this is arguably not the case when you factor in the emissions created in the manufacturing and instruct in infrastructure and the construction of the solar farm, it is the local pollution I wish to focus on. 1.1 million solar panels and the fact that the batteries have to be changed every 12 years is part of this. The vehicle movements during the construction of this enormous scheme will result in particulates from fuel being blown into villages at scales never experienced before. These villages have enjoyed rural life and clean air, which is a choice the residents made when moving to these locations, rather than more urban settings. It is unimaginable that this council would ever allow this to happen, and I would ask that any response to this consultation makes, it, makes clear the real and intolerable impact to the local residents is recognised. Lastly, this application fails to recognise the importance of local views and wishes, and the role of this authority and our elected members is to be the voice of residents when they feel they're like, like they're being railroaded, as this speculative application appears to be attempting to do. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Kelly. Sometimes wish that people would stick to the. However, we've now we've now had that, and there won't be any questions for Councillor Schumann because he's not here. And now we go back. We go back to the formal session, and it's further comments from the officer. If you could, got any points you'd like to make that result of what we've heard today? No, I'll be quick, but also I'm happy if the members ask me questions as there may be questions coming Good questions up. to officer is another section. But um, the points I'd like to raise at this stage is the local impact report has considered all the submitted information that was submitted before it got sent to the inspectorate. 
um, there are going to be temporary loss of public rights of way during construction and during the maintenance work, the developer is wanting to cross those public rights of way. The scheme isn't carbon neutral. The developer has never said it's carbon neutral, which is covered in my report in paragraph 6.14. What the developer is saying is that it's a, a far, and I, we agree, it's a far more uh, renewable energy and it's much cleaner in like uh, greenhouse gas emissions than say something like an, a gas power, powered station. A gas powered station would be 15 times worse. The uh, draft national policy statement, uh, EN3, does say an NSIP solar farm shall have operational life of 25 years and um, on the basis that solar panels can last up to 30 years. But again, that is only draft policy, that's not an adopted statement. Uh, the final thing is our environment health has considered there's no significant concerns regarding construction traffic in regards to air pollution. And uh, again, happy to answer questions if those do happen. Okay, um, members, questions to the officer. Have you got any questions you want to ask uh, Nanju? Councillor Edwards. Um, um, it's, it's a good question because I obviously we've heard the developer, we've heard what you said, and the developer refutes things that you're saying, and you've you've, you've come back to that. Um, are there any um, documents that you feel are really missing at this time that makes it difficult for us to actually have a view? I mean, I'm thinking particularly of the tree survey because it, it, we're obviously looking at what we've got now. There are suggestions that other things will happen later, but we will have no cognizance of that. We won't see that. And, and what concerns me is that that becomes a normal approach. It will happen next week or the week after, but we haven't got that information now. So so what do you feel, if, if I may ask, do you think is actually uh, causing some issues that we don't have, because we don't have the information? No, uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, the decision-making process is ongoing, I suppose, should, should first say, and it won't be um, considered as the final report from the examining authority until March of next year when they sent to the Secretary of State. So between now and then, there's going to be more information provided from all sides to help the examining authority come to decision. In regards to lack of information, what's on screen now is the current like tree report information, which is what our tree officers had to go on, which basically is the same blank document submitted several times related to different parts of the site. So obviously our tree officer cannot provide a professional recommendation on that level of information. Developer is providing a revised arboriculture assessment, um, which is on the, I think I noted down as the 22nd of this month. The other sort of lack of information is, for instance, biodiversity. With our ecology experts from the range of councils have said there's not enough information submitted. And before it's determined, we'd expect that level of information provided so the determining authority could consider all the merits and the harm that would be caused. The battery side of things, which is ongoing, and as I think we said earlier, the technology now may not be the same technology in two years' time. That leads to lots of questions of what batteries going to use, how you put out a fire if there was one, and the space they may require. However, as the developers also said, there is a requirement in the draft development consent order that we would have to agree, as one of the authorities, the fire safety management plan. So there would be later opportunity to make sure there was a plan that was acceptable for fire service, which would also have to consider things like water pollution, if there was going to be battery chemicals put into local water supplies, for instance. Does that cover the question? Yeah, it does. It, it's just that it's a what if, what if, what if, and 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 obviously we're being made to um, make our, our recommendation today on the information that we have got. Could I just ask whether um, the lack of information is tardy or is the lack of why have we not had this information are you able to comment on on that have you had a good working relationships with, with the developer in order to to achieve these reports we've had ongoing conversations with developer through different kinds of meetings uh, and they are continuing um we have asked for information to be provided you know before now 
you know, we've said to them what we're lacking or what we have concerns over. That started off in our relevant representation, which we submitted in March of this year, where we gave an overview of our concerns. And that has continued until now. Developer is providing more information, though, as you're saying, it is kind of much later in the process than we would like or I would like for certain. Any more questions? Yes. And then thanks for waiting. Jones and then waiting. Well, no, no, it's Jones and, no, it's just Jones and then waiting. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, can I just clarify one other thing? So I was looking through the joint statement about the TPOs, and it says if you're allowed to um, remove trees that are um, including those, um, it, within the authorised development but near any part, how extensive can that be? Uh, could they release a whole row of trees, or is it only limited to sort of one or two? Is there any no, no, limits it, on it? Once the legislature, this is something we've been um, discussing with the examining authority through our non prejudicial comments and a draft and a consent order. As we currently understood it, as the current draft, it would mean that any protected tree could be cut down by a developer because the developer seek to remove tree regulation orders from their requirements. So they don't have to comply with that part of legislation. The other concern we've got is there's no definition of what near means to the development site. And that would leave it up to the developer to define. So also we would be talking to the examining authorities and we want near to be specified. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so you talked about the provision of the uh, the loss of habitat um, being slightly less than you um, envisaged. Um, I noticed in, again in one of the reports, um, it, it there was concern about well, actually when it becomes available, would it be able to get there any um, prior to? Sorry, I'm just trying to I can't find the page in my my book um, uh, about the the land being made prior. To development for to to establishment of the uh, the wildlife and breeding seasons and things like that. Yeah, not an ecology expert, but some species, uh, stone curlews, I think, are the most pr uh, primary one of these. Do not like any noise near them, for instance. So any disturbance to them would be quite detrimental. So there's certain species you might want to have that land, your mitigation land, put first forward first before you start any construction work. And then just to go on. It's also the time of when that ag that uh, biodiversity land disappears. Does it end like literally on the 40-year date, or do, is there a crossover period to cover that, you know, that nesting season, for instance? Councillor Wilson. Thank, thank you, Chair. <coughs> We've been talking about how long this planning application goes on for, and, and I believe you said the norm is 25 years, and what they're asking for is 40 years. But in fact, once we've got these solar panels, they're not likely to ever go away, are they? They want to put, replace them with other solar panels if they're making income from them. So, and, and what's the dis? I mean, isn't it a disadvantage for them to come along and take it all out again? You've got a con sort of similar sort of construction thing. Um, wouldn't it be simpler if, if they're there? Why why try and remove them after 25 years? What's the advantage of removing them? The development consent order, if granted on the basis of what the developer is seeking would be 40 years, and that would require the decommissioning of them. It doesn't mean the developer couldn't come in for another national strategic infrastructure project, if the legislation is saying for a similar solar farm on adjacent or same land, for instance, so they just continue their development. But that would be a separate application, not what's being considered today. Mm. What we considered today would be this development for the period of 40 years. So in fact, what you're saying is that uh, uh, before the 40 years, they'd have to come along with another planning application to keep it there. They would have to come in with another NSIP process to get another development consent order if they wanted to do something else. And that would have to go through the same process, same Secretary of State sign off, and it may be granted or refused. But that's not the application. We shouldn't be considering a potential future solar farm, or energy farm. We should be considering what this energy farm is. And the merits and flaws of this proposal. And the reason for it being a, a limited time is that these panels will wear out or stop, cease working after a period of time. Is that right? That's basically it, is it? 
there is a lifetime for certain panels like any equipment, and that's what I think the draft uh, draft um, policy statement is trying to suggest. Their lifetime, they're suggesting from national level is 30 years. And can I ask one totally different question? <clears throat> um, we're talking about trees. When we looked around the fields that you were pointing out yesterday, there were hardly any trees involved, were there? There, there, were, there were some hedges, which we might have to worry about, but not, not very many trees. Bear with me, because the sites are different. Uh, if I can find it. Um, so on this site, for instance, this is uh, in South of Sydney, uh, for instance, that tree belt and that tree belt are existing. There are some trees along here. So there are some trees that are on site. It's just because I can't take you on private land, I couldn't take you to all those places. But on certain other places uh, near Iceland, there's very few existing trees, and in the very we seek them to plant a lot more. Okay, um, I, I've written down some facts or, or some figures down here, and I'd just like to be to confirm that it, it's right or wrong. Uh, Councillor Schumann in his report said that there would actually be 1.1 million panels. Is that a fact or is that... Uh... I couldn't comment because it, we're defining site areas and the panels, no panels maybe be that or not be that. So we don't, we don't know. I wouldn't want to state. No, and uh, am I right in th thinking that there was, was it 981 hectares was the total? Uh... Uh, yes, and um, that's excluding the cable route. That so plus, plus cable. Yes, yeah, excluding cable route, it's 981 hectares. And that would be about 2,500 2, acres. Uh, it's in my report, but I, c I can find it if you want, but I have labelled it somewhere in my report. Two, four, two, four, I'm told. That's fine. Two, point four, two, four, two. No, uh, 2,424 acres. 2,424 acres. Okay. That's that, and uh, there are 77 acres of battery. Uh, yes, that sounds correct. Uh, in, and I've also got the compound, I mentioned it in my presentation. <laughs> they, were, they were the facts I wanted clarifying, I'm okay with that. Okay, it, I can find the size of the battery farm, if you want me to, in our district is... Yes, uh, the best compound site is 83,000 square metres. I, I heard a figure of 77 acres, I don't know. Uh, that I don't know the, the conversion rate off the top of my head, but it would equal, if you want it in square feet, uh, nine, 947,224 square feet. No, I'll, 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 I'll just assume that was a large area yeah. because that, that, that's not easy to envisage. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Ambrose Smith, Christine. Just a small point, really. Um, Councillor Wilson referred to the possibility, the potential probability of a site continuing after 40 years. Somewhere in this chamber today, I have heard someone say, and it could have been the speaker for Seneca, um, saying that a portion of the land is leased and not owned. And that being the case, that may that that might be something that would halt the uh, uh, a scheme going on before, um, on after forty years, if that was even a question. The development, if granted by the Secretary of State, would be this proposal for that forty-year period, in accordance with the 
according to their own consent order. So whether it's leased or compulsory purchased, that is the development on that part of land for that length of time. Councillor Every. Thank you, Chair. Sorry to come back. Um, I, I just wanted, um, if you can clarification, if, if I may have it, um, the, the, the words poor quality have are, appear in your draft response uh, in the third paragraph down, but I've heard other people use that terminology. Could you explain in planning terms what you mean by that? Is because because it, it, it it's um it, it's not it's not clear. So an overall poor quality, um, a bit difficult to quantify. If you could, no, that's fine. I'll that do my best. Um, so the landscape scheme being proposed is quite generic. Is probably the best way to describe it. So. The Fen landscape around Iceland is a very different landscape area than what you'd see around Chippenham. So the developer is just planting trees that obscure development isn't good planning practice. Landscapes are used to help mitigate and help blend development into its wider setting. Planting lots of trees say around Iceland, that would actually could harm the overall landscape because then you lose the feeling of openness, which is very much the Fen landscape which this parcel is the very edge of the E05 before it goes into the Brackland Suffolk sort of landscape. Yeah, it's the landscape's not responding, the planting's not responding to the existing landscape, it's forcing a particular planting on the current landscape. Yeah. Yes, it's generic landscape. It's not necessarily bad, it's just not put it working with its current confines and landscape. Councillor Jones. Um, just one last part, Andrew, and I know it's not exactly within your remit, but um, a large part of the um, uh, the local impact report talks about um, transport and its effect on it. Um, the fact we've got low roads, it's causing uh, degradation at the edge of the road on small ones for large vehicle parking. Uh, abnormally large vehicles. I know the county council are objecting to it um, on that part. Um, is there suitable in place to make sure these reparations are done? Um, I know uh, Cairnshire County Council and Suffolk County Council are working with the developer and considering what opposite contributions or mitigation measures might be required to repair any damage. Um, from our point of view, we're looking at the con what construction traffic might cause, not from the impact of the fabric of the road, but the impact it might have on businesses, residents, that kind of thing. Is that it, members? Questions? Questions to the officer? You made the point that you're unhappy about banks of trees being planted to shield the um, tunnels and so on. And yet, on how many um, other applications do we look at? And we actively encourage planting around estates and um, buildings and things. Um, is there a slight disconnect there, or is this just a purely different way you look at uh, an application? Landscape, as I say, it should be used to um, just obscure development. It should be used to, you know, help blend it into the wider countryside. And a lot of housing development, for instance, is built on the edge of settlements. So you're just moving that settlement um, built form slightly further into the countryside. So it's not quite the same as if you're in a very remote location. I hope that gives you an answer. Okay, we now, Councillor Wilson. We haven't really looked at the economic aspect of these things. <clears throat> I'd assumed that Sonny could, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Sonny could buy this land and, and put their things on it, but they're not. They, they're renting this land from local farmers who presumably will get an income and presumably be at least as much, if not more, income than they would be getting from their crops without any um, cost to them of actually uh, preparing a, a crop and 
farming it and tractors driving over it or anything else. So, in fact, <coughs> there'll be less agricultural machinery on this land and therefore less CO2 because of that. Have, uh, but there will be income to the farmers to, and I assume that they'll then be able to pay, I assume, business rates to the local council. So there'll be a, some money coming in from this area. We don't know how much, but there's we haven't taken that sort of thing into consideration at all, have we? Business rates are a material planning reason, and that's separate to no, I realize yeah, that. that side of thing. Um, and again, landowners push out their own land, um, be that renting it out, selling it. Um, so I wouldn't want to get into that side of things. Obviously, the developer has a business model. They've gone and found land, and they wish to go along with this development that will make money or should make money for both themselves and others. That doesn't mean it's unacceptable or acceptable in planning terms. We are just looking at the material merits of the scheme and whether that outweighs any harm this scheme proposes. And will it be less employment or more employment, do you think? During construction period, I imagine this is going to be very employment intensive. Afterwards, it's not going to ha likely have that many people working. It'll be maintenance work, so that's going to be a very low employer. But that's one of the questions we're raising through our economic questions. How many people are working, where they come from? Are they local people? Are they coming from long distance away and having to live on site, for instance? Well, that's the end of the uh, questions to officers. And we're now going to move into the debate on the application. And members, uh, David Ambrose Smith. Chair. I believe that uh, Sonica have consulted with the community, uh, but unfortunately, their voice has not been heard. An example Mr. Murray came up with uh, himself earlier uh, was a small area of panels that uh, was, uh, was asked that they could they be reviewed in the position they were in. And he simply said, we're not prepared to review the scheme in that area. I think that's, that's showing that things aren't really working. So, simply, uh, Sonica um, do not like confrontation and uh, uh, have, little, have shown little ability to deal with this. This is just another, another development for Sonica, one of many around the country, as has just, met, just been mentioned. Uh, so it's very difficult to support this uh, because the voice of the community has not been heard. Thank you. Well, I've, I've uh, got to make my comments now. Um, I'm actually, uh, I intend to propose, but I will continue with the debate, but I intend to propose that we agree with the officers on, on this uh, application. Uh, I think it will have uh, an. In I think it will have an impact on horse racing, and I think you know the new market is a, is a centre of the horse racing world, and I think it's something that's very precious to us. <coughs> I, I I believe that there would be uh, damage to the park and garden at Chippenham, and uh, I think there would be accumulative damage to both uh, Islam and Chippenham and the whole feel and the rural feel and the countryside feel that exists at the moment, I feel that would be extensively damaged. I think the biodiversity at uh, in Snail Whale, at Snail Well uh, would be damaged uh, and I think there's been a, a lack of information given to ECAMS officers and, uh, and I think the consultation has been, um, well, I, I don't think it would win prizes. So uh, I, I, uh, that's what I intend to do, and I intend that we, that we, uh, I propose that we support the officers' objections, and uh, I will let now any other members and the councillor every is now going to speak as well. I'm just going to second your proposal, Chair. Okay, thank you. So we have that proposed and second, but we we'll carry on the conversation and uh, or the debate. And, uh, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. 
well, I'm personally very much in favour of uh, using solar panels to generate electricity. <clears throat> and it's very easy to say we're against it because it's next to us. Um, and it's also very common for people with a large development near them to object to it, and that's what we want to expect. Therefore, I'm amazed that Sonica, <clears throat> knowing the sort of thing that would be likely to happen, haven't done a much better effort at involving local people, at explaining any benefits, of making sure that local areas get the benefit, <clears throat> and they haven't done this at all. And then there's information that um, the officers needed, and it was provided very, very late. So um, this looks like Sonica is not a very efficient organisation and certainly isn't caring about the local community. They, if they cared about local community, they'd have made sure that nobody could say they weren't consulted because they'd be consulted out of their ears. You know, <clears throat> if you really wanted something as, as important as this and, and, and the amount of money that's being spent on this is millions, you know, spending perhaps a, a million pounds on proper consultation would have been a good thing to do in the first place. So it worries me that if Sonica are doing this exercise, I think on the cheap and not very well, they're probably not the best organisation to actually provide a massive uh, solar farm. Um, so my personal view is that I will be supporting the chairman's point of view. Not be I wouldn't normally do so. I would, you no, know, not because it's a chairman. I, 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 I wouldn't. I would normally support. Um, a solar farm, and we have in fact supported solar farms across the district, but they're much smaller and they're done in a proper way, and the people round about all know about it. And and and, and it, you know this this is done um, in an arbitrary way, as far as I can see. And uh, and the people who live near it naturally object, haven't been properly consulted, and you know naturally the local parishes feel that they shouldn't uh, have these things in their area. It's too big, basically. That's the real problem. And it hasn't been thought through properly. And the officers should have been really helped by getting the information quickly to exactly what they wanted. And you can see from the paper, they obviously haven't done that. So I'm against Sonica themselves doing this enormous um, energy fund. Thank you. Just in mind, Ray Smith. I'm genuinely, genuinely torn about this. In fact, um, I support almost everything that uh, Councillor Wilson has just said. Um, <laughs> I, I always find it a problem when I find people who object to things because it's on their doorstep or in their backyard, um, because to make progress, we do have to um, you know, push things on a bit. However, um, I do think there are worrying aspects, so I think I will be um, following your lead, Chair. Councillor Jones. Um, thank you, Chair. No, I, I'm broadly in, in support of what, what, what people have said here. Um, I must admit, I'm quite torn as well. Um, I know from my own family, um, I have people who live near Isom. Uh, I've got a mother and a, my son used to live in Isom as well at one point. He's not, not there anymore. Um, I do think it's a bit of a generational thing. Um, those with the landowners, the people with the houses in, in villages are, you know, a little bit not in my backyard, where I know my son is a, a younger generation, so I'm a lot more accepting and wanting the solar power. Um, you know, feeling that, you know, um, that... Uh, you know, the green and pleasant countryside that we currently got is not going to be there if we continue to get global warming and end up being desert sort of thing. So we, you know, we need to make that change. Um, and it has got to go somewhere. Having said that, um, I do feel the impact on the, on the new market um, racing scene uh, will be quite detrimental. And there are certain aspects that perhaps we do need to look to protect more than others than, than perhaps just some of the rural countryside. Um, all that said, I think in the end, I'm... Uh, in agreement with um, the planning officers on this one uh, in, in rejecting it. Any other comments? Okay, well, as, as uh, has been said before today, uh, we are not making a decision here. We are only making a recommendation as a consultee. So we, we can, we're not in a position to say, uh, make a decision. 
So we are going to, uh, I, unless anybody else has got anything to say, I intend to go to the vote. And uh, I, I think the, the way of doing it has been proposed by me, seconded by Councillor Every, and it is as on page one of the agenda, which is to approve the consultation response, which sets out the Council's objection to elements of the proposal as set out in Appendix 1 and in, in small 2. In the event that the proposal is approved by the examining body, delegate authority to the case officer in consultation with the Chairman of the Planning Committee to determine the requirements under the Development Consent Order. That is the proposal, and I'm going... Chair here, but uh, we're, we have one of the available. I believe that is automatic that whenever we say okay. chair in, in any context, should the chair not be there, the vice chairman would be. Yeah. Yeah. Do we get the uh, disagreement? Do you believe it? That's, I'm, that's a shocking state of affairs, yeah. Councillor Ambrose Smith, but nevertheless, and I will just check it up with the monitoring officer. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that if we say chairman and the chairman isn't available, we have the vice chair become chair. Is that correct? I am advised that is my opinion is correct. I'm, I'm pleased that you're correct on this proposal. Right. Well, those in <laughs> well, those in favour of that proposal, please raise their hands. Well, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And the um, meeting is now closed. Thank you for attending. Uh, and appreciate.